Young Abe Lincoln by Cheryl Harness February 12, 1809 Winter winds were whooping and whipping round the cabin in the Kentucky woods. They cried at the chinks in the stout log walls, but they couldn't get inside the firelit cabin where a new baby boy lay safe and warm in his mother's arms. Tom Lincoln smiled at two-year-old Sarah. Look now! Here's your brother, Abraham. He'll soon be a-tagging along after you, shirt tail a-flappin'. Six winters later, Nancy Lincoln was sewing buckskin breeches for her little boy to wear to school in the spring once the crops were planted. A proud smile lighted her thin face. She said, It's a precious thing to learn reading, writing, and cipherin'. You and your sister have a chance I never got. School was two miles down the deep-rutted Cumberland Trail, leading to Louisville in the north and to Nashville way off to the south. Abe and Sarah met peddlers, pioneers on their way to a new frontier settlements, and other travelers whose heavy wagons, ox carts, and brightly painted carriages and coaches rumbled down the rugged road. Sometimes they saw a work overseer or slave trader riding horseback behind a troop of dusty slaves. When Abe and Sarah got to the tiny school cabin, they heard a singing, songy gabble. Don't be scared, Abe, said Sarah. It's just the way they read their lessons, out loud like that so the master can tell they're studying. Tall Mr. Rennie set them to reciting and learning letters and numbers. When school ended at harvest time, Abe had learned to write words. He liked making words on a board with a piece of charcoal, on a shovel with a bit of soapstone, or in the dust with a stick. Abe, his father's voice came hollering from the fields, breaking into Abe's daydreams. Come get to work. Way off to the north of their farm, just beyond the Ohio River, was Indiana. Partly because Tom Lincoln didn't approve of slavery, which was legal in Kentucky, he moved his family to Indiana. Abe's gray eyes were wide with astonishment when he saw the mighty river and imagined the cold waters down and dark beneath the raft. That icy December of 1816, Indiana became the 19th state in the Union. The Lincolns quickly built a three-sided shelter on their homestead near Little Pigeon Creek. On the fourth side was a blazing, smoking fire that could never be allowed to go out. It saved them from freezing to death and scared the wolves and panthers away. Before spring came to the Indiana woods, neighbors were stomping and whistling through the snowy forest to help the newcomers build a cabin, as was the frontier custom. Seven-year-old Abe swung his axe alongside the big boys and whiskery men. Hunting and gathering food, clearing the land, splitting log rails for fences, and hauling water left no time for school. Besides, there wasn't any school to go to. Abe practiced writing and listened hard when grown-ups were talking. He wanted to remember and understand words and ideas. Abe was glad when his mother's relatives, Tom and Betsy Sparrow, and 17-year-old Dennis Hanks came from Kentucky to live nearby. It's so good to see home folks, Nancy cried. She was worn thin with work and lonely from news from home. Barely a year later, when farmers were getting in the harvest of 1818, fearsome word went traveling through the forest. The milk sickness was killing cows and people. By the 5th of October, the sparrows had died and Nancy followed after. Tom and Dennis sawed the boards. Abe whittled the pine pegs. Then Sarah lined the narrow coffin with Nancy's best quilt. Nine-year-old Abe was sunk in sadness. Too sad for words. Too sad. It was the loneliest time. Eleven-year-old Sarah tried to make corn dodgers and stew as good as Nancy's tried to keep the dirt-floored cabin clean and their clothes washed and mended. Tom, Abe, and Dennis, wearing boots made of tree bark, worked outside from dawn to dark. They could hear the ringing of other men's axes way off all through the woods along Little Pigeon Creek. One night at supper, Tom said, 
We're going to have us a church and a school. We got enough folks hereabouts to pay a teacher now. Abe felt like he was being wakened from a long, gloomy dream. School? Cousin Dennis puffed a smoke ring from his cob pipe, and Tom smiled. Yep, there's going to be a school starting after harvest. Your ma had her, um, a hunger for learning for you young'uns. She'll have been gone a hard year come fall, and <clears throat> Tom cleared his throat noisily and said, uh, I'll, I'll be off to Kentucky for a spell. Got me some business to tend to. Abe and his sister walked a mile and a half to the school cabin, shook hands with Mr. Crawford, the schoolmaster, and took their places at the split log desks and benches. They and the other children studied such books as Webster's Blue Back Speller and Murray's English Reader. They hurried home in the cold gray afternoons. Chores were waiting. Spelling and reading beat cooking and carrying water any day, Sarah exclaimed. Abe swept off his coonskin cap and recited grandly. Good boys who to their books apply will be great men by and by. Sarah pushed him off his stump with a playful shove. Just inside of the cabin one December afternoon, Abe and Sarah heard heavy wheels and the plodding of heavy horses coming through the woods. High on the buckboard of a huge wagon sat Tom Lincoln and a rosy-faced woman. Abe stood at the edge of the clearing, shivering in his tattered buckskins. Sarah pulled her mother's old shawl close about her shoulders. They stared. Tom helped the lady down, saying as he did so, Here's your new ma, Sally Bush Johnston. I knowed her when I was a boy and she a little gal. Her husband's done passed away, and these young'uns are her girls, Sarah Elizabeth and Matilda, and her boy John. Three long-legged children climbed down off the feather bed on top of the load of bundles and furniture. We'll be a family together, Tom finished in a rush. The new Mrs. Lincoln patted Sarah's cheek. My Elizabeth has a dress just your size, I reckon. Then we'll do with some sewing. Turning to Abe, she said, I hear you're a scholar. How old are you, Abraham? Uh, yes, ma'am, Abe whispered. Ele Eleven this coming February, ma'am. There are books in my trunk, Abraham, she said kindly, pushing Abe's rough, dark hair back out of his eyes. We'll get along fine. She bowed her bonnet to Dennis Hanks, who was standing with his mouth open in the cabin doorway. Sally gave the cabin a sharp look. Tom, fetch me some water. We got to be scrubbing before there's any unpacking. Abe's pants were always too short, seemed like, as he grew tall and taller, working in his father's fields, reading Sally's books. He memorized Aesop's fables, read over and over her Robinson Crusoe and Pilgrim's Progress and her Bible. Abe walked for miles to borrow the few books owned by his frontier neighbors. He listened to the rivermen and farmers talking politics in Mr. Gentry's store. As the Lincoln farm was more prosperous, Abe wore rawhide boots on his big feet. He grew strong, swinging his axe and wrenching out tree stumps, but he preferred reading the law books in Judge Pete's and Lawyer Pitcher's offices and reciting the political speeches he had memorized from the newspapers. That boy's always got his lazy nose in a book, Tom muttered. He's had all the learning a man needs, ain't he? He's got a head full of questions, Sally said fondly. Just before Abe's 19th birthday in 1828, Abe's sister Sarah, who had been Mrs. Aaron Grigsby since the summer of 1826, died along with her baby in childbirth. After this tragedy, Abe grew even more thoughtful. He missed her. When Abe hired out to do farm work or cut wood for others, and when he began working on the Ohio as a boatsman, Abe turned his wages over to his father. This was the proper custom until Abe was 21 when he came of age. One afternoon, Mr. Gentry told Abe, I have a load of goods to be sold in New Orleans, and I need a flatboatman. You interested? I'll pay $8 a month and your steamboat ticket home. Abe and Mr. Gentry's son, Alan, built the flatboat, 18 feet wide and 65 feet long, loaded the cargo, and pushed off for a voyage of a thousand miles down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers.
It took skill to read the river's currents and strength to pilot the big boat around the bends through storms, past log rafts, barges, and steamboats. There'd be river pirates to fight, leaving Abe and his partner bloody. There'd be sights that'd stay in Abe's mind always. Mossy trees, bales of cotton, foreign-voiced sailors from sea-going ships, women in bright silk dresses, and dark-skinned people being bought and sold at the slave market. The three-month journey tested Abe and gave him th time to think on his own about life and his country, its ways and laws and people, a restless river of ideas. He wasn't sure how, but Abe knew he wanted to work with his mind, not his muscles. In his own way, Tom was restless too. He had heard of good land out west in Illinois. Tom and Sally, her grown children and their families, and Dennis Hanks, who had married one of Sally's daughters, all moved to Illinois just after Abe's 21st birthday in 1830. As he didn't have a clear idea of just what he wanted to do, Abe went along too. After one of the coldest of Illinois winters, Abe finally said goodbye to his family. As he described himself later on, Abe was a floating piece of driftwood who came to stop in the tiny village of New Salem, Illinois on the Sagamon River, July 1831. By the time he left New Salem six years later, Abe had earned a reputation as an able boatman, honest postmaster, storekeeper, land surveyor, soldier, and a wrestler who could throw the toughest guys around, then shake hands and tell a funny story. He studied with the schoolmaster and borrowed law books from Lawyer Stewart, 16 miles away over in the town of Springfield. Abe studied grammar and joined the New Salem Debating Society to learn to speak his ideas with force and logic. He had decided to be a politician and represent his neighbors at the Illinois General Assembly in Vandalia. People laughed at how he looked, then liked how he talked. Abe got elected on his second try in 1834. He was 25 years old. Abe read law books as he rode the country roads between the state capital in Vandalia and his home in New Salem. He helped to make laws about taxes, schools, and such internal improvements as widening rivers and digging canals for inland navigation. Abe Lincoln was ambitious to be known as the DeWitt Clinton of Illinois, after the New York governor who had championed the Great Erie Canal. Abe also joined in the successful campaign to make Springfield the capital of his state. When Abe was 28 years old, he packed his saddlebags with his clothes and books. He tucked his new license to practice law in the band of his silk stovepipe hat and trotted out of New Salem with a wave goodbye to his neighbors. So long, Abe, his friends called after him. That evening of April 15, 1837, the tall, gangly man with sad eyes set deep rode down the muddy main street of his new hometown. What was the future hiding for him behind its back here in Springfield, Illinois? Young Abe Lincoln must have wondered.